But isn't it interesting how we are counting our days out by the seasons of the year? When I think maybe we should be counting our days out by the seasons of God and asking him to number our days for us. Not the commercial world, not the world that we live in. Ask God to number our days for us so that we can live them right and fruitfully for him and for his kingdom. And this is what Moses learned. But the question we have to ask is, if you want to reflect and ask God, how do I live my days right? Help me to number my days. What does that mean in practice? This is GBC Web TV on the internet at gbcweb.tv. Welcome to Greenford Baptist Church in West London. Here you can watch inspired biblical teaching and find out how to apply God's word to your everyday lives. On the website, you can also listen to audio versions of these programs or download them as podcasts. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us so far this morning, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, uh, Lord, we pray for your, your spirit. Holy Spirit, just speak to us. Speak to us individually and speak to us as church. Speak to us as your children, Lord, as the Father that you are that wishes to talk to us. In your name, amen. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Does it get to the point you suddenly realise you, you you stop saying that. I don't know when that is officially, but I thought first Sunday morning of 2010 or 2010, whatever your preference is. I can't believe the BBC used up a good 10 minutes discussing whether you should call it 2010, 2010, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Happy New Year. How has 2009 felt? How did it feel? Quick. Quick, yeah. Did it feel like it absolutely rushed past? did, didn't it? Some of us, it might felt more of a hard slog, really trudging through water, you know, really going through the mud and not enjoying 2009 much. It just feels like it wasn't that long ago, and it wasn't that long ago, it was only a year ago, but there was, you know, tail end of 2008, recession was official, jobs were being lost, uh, and, and life just had this whole sense of doom and gloom about it, you know, it was everywhere you read it on the news, you listened to it. Did you, yeah, anybody getting that experience? I mean, it still is now, We're officially as a country, not out of recession yet. But um, it seems I was listening to the news this morning, I was saying, come on, give us something cheerful, you know. And, um, but it just seems like things were really, really important in 2009. Things that, have today, you know, I don't know about you, but there were probably certain things that felt really important at the time in 2009. Felt like things I really needed to worry about or be concerned about. But actually, they flew past really quickly, come out of the other end of it, and actually probably forgotten half the stuff, if not three quarters of the stuff, that plagued my mind in 2009. Is anybody else feeling the same experience? Yeah? Possibly? Some of it does drag on, you know, some of it doesn't mean that 2009, everything stops that's happened and we don't get some overhanging to 2010. Maybe some of our situations are still occurring for us. But maybe less in our minds so much. Also in 2009, lots of people I know were working lots of extra hours, not just for overtime, but to keep their jobs. They feel they needed to work over and above their level to look good to keep their jobs. But it was only 365 days, and it went past very, very quickly. I felt it's just flown by. So what was really important in 2000 time may not have been so important now, and you realise you've probably forgotten some of it. Maybe you can reflect now over 2009 in your heads and just think from January to now, what happened? I tried to do that, I tried to do that last week when I prepared this last week. I sat there for myself and gone, beyond obviously it was the first full year um, here in this post, um, what's happened? And there was a lot I'd realised I'd forgotten, stuff that had 
caused me concern or, or, or caused me happiness. And actually, I'd forgotten about. And it was bizarre when you realise how much you do. But at the time, it meant a lot. So we're going to look. We're going to look at something about where we should be focused. Psalm 90. Would you like to turn to it, please? Should be page 599. I'm hoping if you have a red church Bible. I'm sorry if you've got the big blue ones. I didn't note the page. But Psalm 90. Psalm 90. I'm not going to read it. We're all going to read it to ourselves. I'm not going to read it out loud. I'd like us to spend now some time. It's a really good psalm. Do you remember that time, that um, last time I'd done it? We spent about 10 minutes reading through it slowly, about three times. Do you remember that? Who remembers that? Who was here when we did that? It's called sort of version of Lecto Divina. We (coughs) meditated on it. I want us to do the same. We asked God this morning to talk to us through his word. He does that sometimes when we just read it to ourselves for a while. So I'd like you now, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to have no music, but just to read it through for yourself slowly, asking God to show you what is he talking about. What does he want to say to you this morning? So if you'd like to start now, please read Psalm 90. How many sort of heard God talk to them as they were reading. You have to stick your hands in the air, but you know, do you feel God start influencing some of your speaking at this time? Your thinking? Or how many sort of minds sort of wandered off, found it hard, and within two or three minutes you started thinking about uh, what you've got to do this afternoon, or... Ah, notice there's lots of giggling going on. (laughs) Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? It is a toughie to do, but you know, it's... Works on where our focus is. As you can see, most of us who have the Church Bible, it says right at the beginning, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And so this is meant to be a prayer of Moses. And it would have been out of a reflection of, uh, and during the time of the time that the Israelites were in wilderness, walking around in the, the wilderness state, you know, in the, so that the, uh, as we all know the story, they came out of Egypt and then Israelites sort of in the first generation rebelled against God, didn't they? They grumbled and moaned and said there's no way they can conquer that. So in God's anger and uh, rightful judgment, he said, right, first generation are not going to inherit the promised land. You can walk around in wilderness for a very, very, very long time until you're all gone. So actually, Moses was seeing the first generation, the first generation that came out of Egypt, sort of dying, (coughs) passing away. So really, this is a lament, a wail of a psalm. Good way to start the new enthusiastic year, isn't it? Let's carry on. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. Let me read verses 1 to 6. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. Those first six verses to me give you the bigger picture. They give you the bigger picture of the concept of man or woman. When I say man, you know I double gender, okay? But man and God. God the everlasting, the eternal, the constant, the forever there, and then there's us. We are mortal. We are here on this earth but a short time. It gives us the concept of the temporary. And it gives, shows that God has the bigger picture. 
He can see the span of it bigger than man can. In the last term at LST, London, my college that I go to, two days of the week, we were studying church history, the early church history from the day of Pentecost right through to 1500, thereabouts, just before uh, what called the period of Reformation. And it was interesting to see how much had gone on in those 1500 years, 1,500 years, how much decisions had been made about who God was and, you know, various sort of ways of trying to understand God, the Bible, how the Bible had come together, the Bible that we read here, how this had come together. It was fascinating. I thought, gosh, such a lot of history, a lot of time has gone past. Yet to God, basically it's but a day. It's but a day. And I think of all the people that were involved, I had to study all different um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, theologians at the time, like Augustine, all heard of Augustine. He's probably one of the Book of Confessions, one of the most famous ones in Western church society. And um, I had to look at all these different guys that come out with all these different things. And I thought, wow, but still to God, it was but basically one day. God has the bigger picture. So where in verse three it says, you turn men back to dust, saying, return to dust, O sons of men. We are very temporary. Very, very temporary. It's God that's in control of life and death. Yes? It's very clear in this psalm that God is in control of life and death. I'm going to say this. It's not angels. It's not demons. It's not witches. And I don't mean the pointy hat ones you get portrayed. I believe I have to say it, and so I'm going to say it again. It is not witches. It's not doctors, not nurses, not hospitals or policemen who are in control of our life and death. It is God. Do you agree? Amen. Do you agree? Yes. <coughs> so where is your dwelling place? Where is your focus? Where is it? Where is our focus? If we agree that God is the only one who's in control of our life and our death, where is our focus? Did you have a chance to reflect over your 2009 when you was reading through this? Did some things pop into your head? Where was your focus at points? Did you spend your time, some of your focus actually not focused on God, but actually worrying about every situation you're in and forgetting to ask God to help? We all do, I do. <laughs> Just because you work in a church building virtually permanently doesn't mean that you're forever focused on God. You do, it's very easy to sometimes lose your focus. But I'm asking you, where is your dwelling place? Where do you put your security? Let's look at what dwelling is. What do you consider to be a dwelling? Some of us, we like it to call it our houses, don't we? This is my dwelling, this is where I am. This is where I dwell, is within my house. This is where I feel most secure, is when I close that front door. Could be your workplace is your dwelling place. You feel most secure when you're at work. But God is meant to be the dwelling place, isn't he? He's got control of everything. So I'm asking you just to reflect on the last 12 months, where has your focus been? God is in control. He has the bigger picture. The clock is always ticking, but God is always in control. I've always got this thing at the moment. Every now and again, I find myself reflecting on a clock ticking. I don't ever really notice that sometimes. If you sit long enough and you have, we've activated some clocks in our houses recently, that's probably not helped. And I mean proper clocks, you know, proper tick, 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 tick clocks, not, not nice digital ones. And occasionally I just hear them going tick, 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 and I think, yeah, what am I doing? Life is ticking away and it rushes past. So what am I doing with it? Where is my focus? Where is my dwelling? Should be with God. 
What have I done with 2009? What have I done for the last 10 years? That could be some of our questions to ourselves. Very temporary. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our inequities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. Nice, cheerful verse. <laughs> Now, I know that we are in New Covenant. I know this morning we have spent time in communion. I know that this morning we have spent time singing about God's grace and how much he loves us and looks into the depths of our hearts, yet still loves us. And that is true. We are in a New Covenant. We're in the sort of, to coin a phrase, a Jesus Covenant. We're under grace, not under law. But God's anger with us is not to be trifled with. It's still the same God, yes? Still the same loving God. And so he does like, unfortunately, because he is our loving father, to occasionally has to discipline us. And he does it because he loves us and he wants us to become the full workmanship that he has created us to be. The full masterpiece that he wants us to be. So secret sin secret sin. This was taken out of the Israelites having sinned against God. They were walking around in the wilderness. Israel must have felt, if you could put yourself in their shoes just for a moment, been walking around in the wilderness for years, not having a permanent dwelling place. Most of us live in houses, do we not? We live with bricks. It has this sort of permanent structure about it, doesn't it? It's there. I know some live in boats, but it still has a permanent structure about it. They were walking around in wilderness because of God's judgment upon them. They must have had a constant reminder of the things that they had done wrong and how they had rebelled against God. It must have been incredibly wearing, yes? <coughs> must have been very wearing. God still loved them and still very much provided with them. I mean, their shoe wear never wore out. They had food every morning provided. So God never left them, he still provided for them. But because of their, one of their sins, it had a consequence for them. And it had a constant consequence. It was a secret sin that had been, it wasn't a secret sin, it was quite obvious really. They thought they'd probably get away with it by grumbling and moaning, but it must have been a constant reminder for them. And this, so the first generation's response was not to, uh, so for this first generation, they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. So the worst thing for them was it was actually being inflicted, their sin was being inflicted upon the next generation. Because it wasn't the first generation walking around for 40 years, after the 40 years, it stopped, and then the next generation took over and walked into the promised land. The next generation was still walking around with the first generation, being born, being brought up, in the midst of this wilderness, in the midst of the consequence, the first generational sin. Yes? Did you see that? It had an influence and an impact upon the next generation. <coughs> Stuff that we do wrong, has an impact on the next generation. Even if you have got children, not children of your own, it still has an impact on those around you. I think God wants to talk to some people this morning about secret sin. Secret sin being something you hide, something you do that you've kept behind closed doors, that you've not given up to God to ask him to help you with. It has an effect 
on the next generation. It has an effect on the people around you. Some of us do things wrong and we think it's not affecting anybody else. It's only affecting me. We're not that singular, are we? It does have an impact because it has an impact on inside of us. So it impacts on people outside. And this is the perfect example. This, this, the, the Israelites was the perfect example of an impacting generational sin. They did it, and it impacted on the generation and the generation after that. And our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm not denying that. But that does not give us the excuse to what? Doesn't give us the excuse to, to keep sinning, does it? We have to work on these things with God and through God. We're living in a society, oh, sorry, I'm going to scrap that for a minute. We're living in a society that's slowly teaching us that we can be individuals. All the adverts, the hair adverts, L'Oreal, because you are worth it. Doesn't it? Most of the adverts, most of the impact says it's about you and how you dress and how you look. And you've got to be one on top of somebody else. I just, I can't believe the amount of messages we get. In the movies, it's exactly the same. It's, it's always the one person that sort of saves the day. It's not. We're all interrelated. We all rely upon each other. Seriously, look at each other just for a moment. You all rely upon each other. Whether you're married in a relationship or not, you still rely upon each other. We're church. We rely upon each other to see each other through. So if one of us is suffering, one of us has got a problem that's going on, that will damage the rest of the family. It has have an impact because you're less effective so the family as a whole, the church family as a whole, is less effective. Don't sit there and think, oh, when I leave here, I go home, and what I do at home is okay. It does have an impact. Now, it doesn't have to be sin. It can be laziness. Laziness is a sin, but it can be not willing to be spending time with God. Not having God as our dwelling place the other six and a half days of the week. That has an impact has an impact at Greenford, has an impact at the wider family. Remember what I said to you, God has seen the bigger picture. We sometimes need to see the bigger picture. In our Western society, we get focused too much on, it's about you. It's not, it's about God. We're only here temporarily, it's about God. The stuff that we do now, Really, if it's just going to be for us, it doesn't last very long. Look at the clothes, maybe, that some of us buy. Don't last very long, some of them. But it's very quickly how we decide that something's worn. Let's get rid of it and move on to the next thing. But that's... It's very temporary. Our life here is very temporary. And we need to know that we're very interrelated. I think we need to see that that what we do now has an effect on people around us and next to us. You can see probably in 2009 with the recession, a lot of people were focused on keeping, as I said, keeping their jobs. I'm not saying here at Greenford, I'm just saying generally. And because they thought it was all about them, they spent a lot of their time saying, um, probably trouncing on other people, stepping on them, making sure they got the one-upmanship, making sure they look good in front of their bosses to keep their job. It was interesting. Um, do you remember over 2009, some of the news, I don't know if anybody works for British Airways or anything like that, and I think it was what some of them asking to, uh, their staff to take a pay reduction for a month or miss out so the company could stay afloat. It was interesting just listening to 
I'm not either way on this, but it was just interesting listening to some of the employees saying, well, no, they have to pay us, and the union's stepping in, and you have to pay the individual people. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they're looking at the bigger picture. They're trying to keep the company afloat so that everybody can be employed in the future. But some people are seeing a very short-term view. Do you do that? Do you look at some of what you do and decisions you're making in the next week, but you're seeing it in the short term view? The Israelites saw it in a very short term view when they felt they could not go and conquer the land. They just got fear and, and, and grumbling and stuff. It was a very short term view. We have to see the bigger picture. The investments that we make today in the future may not, we may not see it. It will be the next generation or the next generation. It's not about us. Verse 11 to 12. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So for Moses, after a number of years in the wilderness, wisdom must be finally prevailing on them that they need to live a more fruitful life. So Moses was asking that he be taught to live his days like they were being counted down. To live his life like the days were being counted down. That sounds really miserable, doesn't it? We're on the 3rd of January, 2010. We've got another 362 days to go. Thank you. Pleasure. And I can't believe that somebody on the news today was already working out there was only so many days left to Christmas, 2010. <laughs> I just thought, I just didn't need to hear that this morning. But isn't it interesting how we are counting our days out by the seasons of the year? when I think maybe we should be counting our days out by the seasons of God and asking him to number our days for us. Not the commercial world, not the world that we live in. Ask God to number our days for us so that we can live them right and fruitfully for him and for his kingdom. And this is what Moses learnt. But the question we have to ask is, if you want to reflect and ask God, how do I live my days right? Help me to number my days. What does that mean in practice? What does that mean in practice? That's a question I need people to respond to. I'm going to have to admit this, both David and Andy had said to me, we need to change the batteries on the handheld. And I said, no, it'd be fine. Wisdom was not prevailing for me. So, upon that point, you have to shout out very, very loudly, and I will get close, not too close, and you can speak into this. So, raise your hands, please. What, by numbering your days aright, what does that mean in practice for us today? Gloria. Oh, it's so nice to be close <laughs> to you, Mom. <laughs> You're gonna have to edit some of this, Andy. <laughs> What it really means is that we acknowledge God in all, in every second of every day, but most of us are guilty of not being able to. But if we did, I'm sure that this whole psalm, that our days would go more smoothly and lovingly and safer in God. OK, thank you. Robson. <coughs> Just speak, sorry. Having a better relationship with the others. With others, better relationship with others. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. <coughs> Sorry, not waiting to do such and such when something else happens, but you know, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So not saying, oh, when that happens, then I can do this, but actually saying, okay, what does God want me to do now? Yes, we might have hopes for the future for what God will use us in in different ways, but what are we doing now as well? 
Okay, so not procrastinating, not putting something off because something else has to happen. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, we've got plenty. Joan. <coughs> Just speak, Joan. It's okay. I don't know if it's what Moses meant, but for me, it says, I've got today. I wake up in the morning and I have this day and I don't know if I have any more days or how many there are, but this day I've been given. Okay. To be in God's presence. So today is all the day that we know that we've been given. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine. I don't know if any of you watched Kung Fu Panda, but I've watched it a lot this Christmas. <laughs> um, and it actually says today is a present, and I think that's something that God is saying powerfully. Okay. Kung Fu Panda, but today's a present, and that's quite powerful. It is a present. Yes. <clears throat> is man. I myself, I realise I'm always uh, on a mission and uh, always pray to God and seeking his will to know what I've done and how much left. Okay, yeah. thank you. I think that's a good example then, everyone. Anybody else? What does it mean in practice? That's the issue. What does it mean on daily? David, David's frantically waving. I think um, it, it reminds me of going shopping. When you, forget credit cards, if you're going shopping and you've just got a certain number of pounds to spend, and you've got this list of things you want to buy with those pounds, you, you number the pounds, because mm. you, you can't buy everything that's in the shop. If you, if you buy this, you can't buy that. If you do this, you can't do that. So you, you number your pounds. And I think for me, that number your days reminds us that we've actually only got a certain number of days. And so if we choose to use the day for this, we don't do it for that. Mm. And so it's about thinking what our priorities are, how we, how we spend our time in the way that if we had a limited number of, of pounds, how we would spend our pounds. Thank you. I think we'll finish on that. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry, I didn't notice. I do apologise. <laughs> it's easy to scan above a head. Right. Go ahead. Well, you already mentioned that our life is so temporary. So if so, then it's, it's worth uh, you know, numbering our days so that we can invest properly mm. in future generations in our Lord. Thank you. Right. Yes, it is worth numbering our days. It's interesting, when I was looking at some advertising over the Christmas, how many sales were going on before Christmas and over Christmas and into Christmas and, and future and, and, and I believe already now the shops are asking that the Sunday hours be changed for 2010, because Boxing Day lands on a Sunday. And they want sales. But it's just interesting because we have, as Joan said, only got today. You wake up this morning, it's by God's grace, and you have today. You don't know if, this sounds really miserable, I know, but you don't know if you've got tomorrow. And in the sales, it was interesting. Well, um, a department furniture store, <laughs> abbreviate that if you wish, into three letters, <laughs> who are saying 0% pay nothing for a year and 0% interest for four years. That's under the impression that you're going to be around in five years' time. <laughs> no, no, but did you see what I mean? We, we live that sort of thing that thinks that we're going to be here. <laughs> We don't know. We don't know. But one thing we do know is where does our investment go? Our time is, in, is an investment. The time that's been given to us, we're meant to invest wisely. Maybe we need, we need to ask God to teach us the number of our days, so how we live our life. Another Christmas one for you. There's somebody who all over Christmas has been shown at various points who learned how to number his days when he saw his future. Do you have any idea who I'm talking about? Scrooge, Scrooge exactly. <laughs> Scrooge, what a fantastic example of learning to number your days. He was living his life in a misery, misery way, not being nice to anybody, living for himself. Got shown his future which didn't look very good. And it changed his attitude overnight. 
Now, I don't want to go into the whole Christmas spirits and all that, forget that. I'm just talking about the fact that when he saw how his days were going to end, it changed his attitude. He started living for other people, making sure he invested in other people as well. He didn't live just for himself. God asks us to do the same. We are to live for his kingdom. We're to, he's asking us to number our days. And we have to sometimes look, what does that mean in practice? Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sin, sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days of, as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. After that turning point, after asking to be taught the number of their days, it was at that point that they wanted, obviously, to be pulled out of the wilderness. They wanted to see fruit coming out. And they wanted to see the work of their hands established. It was an understanding that God would establish the work of their hands. It is not down to them. It was an attitude change, a lifestyle change. It was that mental attitude change that says, wake up this morning and said, today is all I've got. What can I do for God's kingdom? How can I go that one step extra, that one step further? But the work of their hands had to be established because their dwelling place was in God. So because their dwelling place was in Christ Jesus, the work of their hands were established because of he was putting their focus in the right place. I didn't really word that very well. If your dwelling place is in God and you spend time with God, it's God's focus that you have, isn't it? So you understand where God wants you to go, what God wants you to do. Because you have spent time in relationship with him, talking to him. He is your ever moment focus. So the work of your hands is because God has put that in you in the first place. Does that make sense? Is everybody, have I made that quite clear enough? I'm not wording that very well, I know, I can tell. It's like Keris. Uh, if I ask Keris to go and uh, tidy her room as she was asked yesterday, because there was books just about covering the floor. I have some vague memory there is carpet in her bedroom. Vague memory. But we asked her to tidy her up. Now, because she just spent some time with me, we were chatting, and then I asked her to go and tidy up her room and put her books back in the shelf. When I returned, she'd done as I'd asked, because it was very neat. She'd done it by spending time with me, knowing what I wanted as her father. She went and did the right thing. The same goes with us. If we spend time with our Father, we know what the right thing is to do, and God will help us establish the work of his hands, of our hands. So this morning in communion, you all had hopes and dreams, didn't you? That you conveyed and you asked to be prayed about. You've asked God to help establish those hopes, haven't you? Those hopes should have come out from God. And it's God's dream. But it's not just for you, it's for his kingdom and for those around. It's God, it will be established. It will happen if it is of God. He establishes the work of our hands when it's for his kingdom and for his righteousness. And that's due to the bigger picture that God has. Some of us may never see the fruit of something that God has asked us to do. As I said, it might be the generation next or the next generation. The people who put this church, who planted this church here, 
we're reaping the benefits of what they planted. We're reaping the fruits of it. We're being blessed, we're growing. God is blessing us, yes? They started off very small. They probably didn't see how it has all progressed. If they come back now, they're going to go, wow. But again, it's back to making God the dwelling place and asking him to number our years. And we went back to, what does that mean in practice? What does it mean in practice? I think God is asking us to make this a year to count for his kingdom, to really stretch out. He's asking each and every one of us to really stretch out for his kingdom. To really make this a year to count. For his kingdom and for the church family. It's a year that God is saying, I need you to learn how to number your days aright. He's talking to me. And it should be something we should all be doing anyway. But let's look at 2010 with, through different eyes, through eyes of grace and through eyes of God. Not being bombarded with how much miserable news there is. But what does it mean in practice? God's not asking us, because some of us are probably sitting there thinking, does that mean I have to make massive changes to my life? Now, tonight, today, this afternoon? God doesn't ask for that. God asks for small changes. Start asking us to look. Some of us, it might be a big leap. It might be a leap that we actually need to accept Jesus into our life in the first place. Be the best decision you ever make for 2010, I can quite assure you. For some of us, it will be also making some changes in our areas, maybe a secret sin that we know we have to confess. For others, it could be just a change in lifestyle. There's some areas of our lifestyle that don't appear to be the way, but they're not really living fully for God. The clock is ticking and we're missing opportunities. Can't make large changes because they're not sustainable and they're not sensible. It has to be small changes, but they are significant changes. It's commitment in the right areas. And I think God is asking that for 2010. Asking us to really focus I always like this. This was something I um, came to me as I was preaching. It's this most appropriate after Christmas and New Year. Changes in our lives are like eating a large cake. Anybody eat a large, large cake recently? Mince pies? It's not possible in one sitting, is it? Have you ever seen the biggest gatto of your life? It's not easy to do it. But small mouthfuls build to big mouthfuls in bite-sized chunks. Small mouthfuls build to big mouthfuls in bite-sized chunks. The Israelites did not learn overnight when they were sent into the wilderness that their attitude had to change. It took over a number of years. Moses' prayer was not on day one of them having to wonder, being told they were wandering around in the wilderness. It would have come after a number of years of learning and wisdom. And some of us are there and we need to now make those steps forwards and make those changes. I think God is asking us, let's make 2010 count for his kingdom. Let us all make some changes. Let's all make that one step further. Let some of us stop walking around in some wilderness. Let's get our dwelling place in God. Let's just talk to God. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, that you love us as your children. And Lord, you ask us to do things because it is for us and it is for those around us. You ask us because you want us to have abundance of life, not a recession of life. 
And Lord, Heavenly Father, I just pray for each and every one of us as you have spoken to us, as you have maybe challenged us. Lord, it's a challenge, because it, but it's an uplifting challenge. It's to see more and more of you flowing through us, not for us to be miserable. Lord, I thank you for that, because you want to see your kingdom break through into your area, and we want to see that as well, Lord. So I ask for 2010, Lord, that you will help us establish the work of our hands, establish those changes that we know that we, some of us, have to make in our attitude and in our lifestyle. Lord, I pray for that for each and every one of us. In your name pray. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching and other videos at gbcweb.tv.